start speaking about value chain analysis okay now this is where uh, the los is speaking about how you can analyze a company in terms of what we just discussed right because at the start we were looking at from more from a business angle now we are looking at more from an understanding of an analyst angle right so well, what is value chain chain analysis is what we are speaking about at the moment and it means to say that identifying the specific so how do you identify right so you will first try to map all the activities a business does and then you will try to put it in certain brackets and try to understand whether the business really has any competitive advantage or whether the business is good bad ugly whatever it is uh, how do you find that right so then first is trying to put in all the activities together then we are trying to find out estimating the value added okay and the cost associated with actions you're trying to just estimate right at the moment then you're trying to identify opportunities for competitive advantage for the business right now this is also given in Michael Porter's 1985 book Competitive Advantage in which five primary activities are included right so the likes of inbound logistics operation outbound logistics marketing sales and service now this might sound like very uh, complicated but let's try to take an example and this will be very very simply uh, simplified to understand right so for example one of the way of understanding whether a business is good uh, is doing good is to take care of the unit economics right so what is unit economics so for example a producer of phone covers uh, might sell a product at one dollar per unit okay so there's an iphone let's say of iphone cover manufacturer who produces that product for one dollar per unit with a direct cost for material and labor of 0 0.2 dollars per unit and a contribution margin which is nothing but the selling price minus the direct cost or the variable cost per unit right which is nothing but 0.2 dollars so that means for each unit that the manufacturer is producing it is having a contribution of 0.8 dollars right now this is not break even point in terms of the business investment this is more towards how much sales does the company needs to do on a regular basis so that it's always profitable right so for example now further to this is if we do not take care of the uh, you know variable costs like labor or marketing or, or salary we are looking at more towards the fixed cost right now this fixed cost cannot be changed and that's also an advantage because as your sales keeps on increasing your fixed cost does not increase right so examples of automobile companies who are manufacturing and their plants are there and they have a fixed cost to maintain that plant or if you're looking at aviation company there's a certain level of leases which have to be paid irrespective of whether we use it or not so that's fixed cost now in order to cover that fixed cost how many units do i have to sell is just nothing but the division of the fixed cost divided by the contribution per unit and it says that at each and every period whichever period you're speaking about it has to sell minimum six lakhs twenty five thousand units so that it enters into the profitable phase it does not mean that still in net profit level it will be profitable but at least they will be able to cover their fixed costs which is much more important right uh, even after that the variable cost still might set the business back into losses okay but at least it's a good sign that they're able to at least cover their fixed costs right now this is a very different presentation of financial statements compared to the general financial statements that we look at in the general financial statements you will not look at uh, the business from a contribution angle you try to look at it from the EBITDA margin uh, EBIT margin or the uh, the PAT margin or the free cash flow for that matter right so that's what is one aspect of the business analysis which is nothing but unit economics right now let's try to look at different business model types in terms of who is selling the product who's making the product right so if you look at in terms of manufacturing you might also have businesses which function under private label which means i will use the brand name of let's say zara or i might use the brand name of h&m but in reality the manufacturer is different that's nothing but private label it's called as labeling okay it can also happen a lot in publishing business wherein uh, the business might be the original creator of the content but it might get labeled in somebody else's name right 
Then there is the licensing arrangement, uh, which is also sometimes also comes under the copyright section, is where we give license to someone to sell under our brand name. Right? Value added sellers are nothing but who add value in the process of the product. Okay, so for example, you might have, uh, let's say we sp speak about lead. Okay, so they are lead manufacturer, but now they might be also. Uh, you know, value adding, which is done by the battery business, right? So that's nothing but value addition in terms of improving the product and then selling. And franchisee, we have already spoken about, right? It's just selling rights is what you have in return for, uh, you know, revenue share. Uh, affiliate marketing is uh, nothing but you do not own the product, but you are enabling to sell the product of someone else, so a lot of in in a lot of sense, uh, this is this the influence marketing is also come comes under the affiliate marketing section, right? Uh, then you've got marketplace, which is pretty evident. You know, Udemy, or you might have Amazon, Flipkart, uh, you know, many other websites in the world uh, would come under the marketplace section, right? It's a very difficult business to survive in unless and until you have a very high reach in terms of the customers and traffic, right? And then you've got aggregators who would just bring everything together. Uh, something like a uh, routers would also be classified as an aggregator of data, right? Then you've got other models like network effects who are uh, in your own network of, you know, mobile users, whatever you're doing, they're adding a value addition. For example, WhatsApp would be classified as a network effect value addition. Uh, then you also have crowdsourcing, uh, you know, sometimes crowdfunding has also uh, been seen as one of the business model in which for a single item, you can get a lot of public to fund that project directly. Right? And then you have hybrid. Uh, hybrid is nothing but saying that none of the businesses actually follow one single strategy. It's not, uh, it's not pretty real in terms of the practical application. You can't say that. I will be a private labor or I will be a marketplace or I will be an aggregator. It depends upon how the business turns out, right? Because these are classifications based on observing various business, how they perform in the market. Not necessarily business have started with this name and then they're trying to follow the strategy. That's not how it works, right? So, uh, you know, iPhone might have the effect of a lot of these various strategies or models that we've already looked at, right? So let's move further in uh, discussing what are the relationship between uh, the company's environment in which the fun company functions. Okay, so you might have external functions like the economic conditions. If the comp if the, the country is in recession, there's nothing much the company can actually do, right? Then you have demographic trends that might be happening over time, right? For example, Germany's population is aging, right? So that's something of an external condition to the business functioning uh, altogether, right? Then you've got sector demand, right? Uh, you know, there are cyclicalities which happen in every businesses from time to time. For example, right now you might have heard uh, that the steel business has not been much performing well since a lot of time. And they're also in a situation of mounting debt, right? Primarily also because a lot of construction businesses in a halt uh, because of China, right? Then you've got the industry cost, right? The whole aspect of operating in a certain business might have certain margin restrictions. For example, in the physical education system, uh, you know, the margins are pretty low because of the infrastructure maintenance that is required. And of course, political, uh, legal and regulatory environments, which you absolutely have no say on. For example, uh, privacy rights, you know, recently, which was triggered in the US, is something uh, which was beyond what uh, you know probably Facebook could have actually anticipated. And then there are of course social trends. Now social trends can also change over time, and some things and some changes might just happen quickly, right? For example, post COVID, a lot of things have become online. People prefer meeting online uh, wherever possible rather than actually doing a physical uh, you know travel and wasting a lot of time, right? Firm specific. It all, uh, you know, sometimes the companies hold a majority in terms of their, uh, you know, life that they've spent in the specific business might have a lot to do 
with how they react towards new uh, products and new services. For example, uh, let me take a very simple example out here, like the EV business out here. Now, this is an interesting business overall, right? However, in India, if you see Hero Motor Corp has been very slow in reacting to, uh, and in fact, not just Hero Motor Corp, but a lot of other uh, you know, manufacturers of two wheelers have been very slow in reacting to the EV segment, although it's a disruptive business. The reason is because, uh, you know, considering that, you know, Hero sells almost 50,000 units per month. And, you know, overall, if you see uh, in the EV segment, two wheelers being sell, sold is about 5,000. So that's not going to be very interesting for the company. You know, people speak about firm maturity in terms of, you know, decline and mature and growth. But in reality, what is actually happening is more towards the culture of the company, right? So when the company has matured, the expectation is to launch a new product, which at least, you know, gives them a 20% growth. With if it does not happen, then probably they will most likely ignore, right? Then the competitive position in terms of pricing, in terms of the quality of the product, all will have an effect on the business outcome. A big aspect of surviving in the business is also whether you are an asset light business, asset heavy, or lean startups. Now, this, uh, nobody really chooses this, but it's more to do with specific industries, right? You can't really uh, manufacture automobiles without going asset heavy because you need plants. You can't manufacture medicines without having plants. So that's more of, uh, you can say, a default which you have to take uh, rather than actually changing anything, right? Of course, if you are working online-based businesses, then you'll obviously be asset light as well as a lean startup. And that will help you in reducing a lot of costs and increasing your margins, right? So let's go further in understanding the different types of business and financial risk of a company, right? So, you know, these topics which are put in are more to do with experience, uh, experiencing business altogether rather than just putting into words. But I'm just trying to make sure that as much as I can, trying to give you as much as knowledge as I have about business overall, right? Steel sector is a clear example of cyclicality, which it is going through at the moment uh, and is going to take some time to recover, right? Uh, then your industry competitors at the moment, how many competitors do you really have, right? Uh, and, and you can actually try to see this together because if your market share is more fragmented, right? So for example, a classic example is education. There are so many players, right? So the competition intensity might be there, but you also have too many players. So nobody really owns any market share. So that might be counterproductive for, you know, you having any say in pricing because pricing might uh, be based on competition overall, right? Then the long-term growth prospects of the industry, right? So you might say that although the lithium battery business today is small, but Overall, it has a fantastic, uh, you know, outcome because considering that uh, global warming is now taking effects in terms of really showing what it can do, uh, you know, there might be no option but to actually reduce carbon emissions and obviously going more green, right? Then you've got the competitive dynamics, which you can put everything else into this category, uh, you know, in terms of the quality of the product, in terms of the service of the product all would come under uh, the competitive dy dynamics, right? Now, in terms of company-specific risk, right, you have the risk of disruption, which I spoke about at the end, right? Uh, you might be a big business, but you might just lose it all together if you are not open to experimentation and if you're not open to introducing new startups up behind or under you to pursue such disruptions. Uh, product market risk, if the product itself it dies off in terms of an alternative which actually comes, then you're gone as well, right? Then uh, what cost advantages does the product give you? How is the product differentiated? How is the network effect? Is it solving a very common problem, right? Also, how much is the switching barriers? For example, in the food delivery business, right? There's not much cost in terms of switching from Zomato to Uber Eats or maybe even Swiggy, right? So there might be not be much loyalty which you might be able to command uh, you know, with customers. 
then you've obviously got the execution just you can ideate as much as possible but if the execution is not there uh, or is always faced with some hurdles then you might not really make it right and the capital investment risk considering that you know you are going to invest so much and if it's going to take a lot of time to recover that's also going to be a lot of factor in terms of the success survival in the business environment social and governance as you will be reading about this in the further curriculums is now officially you know a generic or an important problem that companies have to bear in mind when operating in the environment specifically you are when you're dealing with pollution you have to be very careful and finally operating leverage which we will speak about in the next slide so when we're talking about operating leverage versus financial leverage i'll just give you a very simple example which should knock this off in terms of your understanding uh, supposing we have the option of uh, let's say we are looking at starting a business yeah, so we have a business and uh, let's say we are starting a restaurant right now there are two options of operating this business is one option is we rent everything everything okay that would include also uh, the utensils as well as the cooking as well as the place itself and the other is to own everything right now as soon as you say rent everything you know everything comes in your income statement right so revenue minus expenses all your expenses come in into your income statement itself when you own everything you've got leverage because now you've got to pay interest and you also got to pay principal now the effect is that in case of when things are going good you know this is you know when there's no recession everything is booming the owning everything will always work out better okay because the reason being because you are able to use it to your advantage uh, of paying lesser in terms of uh, owning everything and you are able to scale it as well you can do whatever you want to do whatever place you got you can modify it you can increase the space you can you know increase the seating capacity you might even let it out to somebody else that's okay unless and until you have volume right uh when things are bad this might be much more useful because you can just just you know, stop the service right if you don't want the microwave stop uh giving rent for that right more likely or less right people go out of business uh because of you know financial leverage right financial leverage but due to you know the business aspect right for example in the hoteling i mean uh, in the residence or you can say you know hotel business right you will realize that most of these businesses go bankrupt not really because of the fact that uh, you know they are not able to sustain the revenue it's more to do uh, with you know just maintaining that structure right so i mean it requires a lot of activities which have to be done to sustain that kind of an asset right versus businesses like airbnb which have absolutely no operating or financial leverage altogether so that's what is financial leverage uh, you know in a nutshell if you are trying to discuss uh, and you know good times financial leverage is good bad times operating leverage is good overall there has to be a balance between both uh, taking excess financial leverage will obviously render your financial statements a little more uh you know risky and investors will be a little, you know wary of whether to invest with you or not as well as voters in general will be obviously apprehensive because when things go bad it goes bad right anyways so that's the discussion on business models i hope you uh enjoy the session and i hope things are clear to you and i'll meet you with you on another lesson bye bye